you're uh, a member of Parliament for the Green Party, correct? That's correct. Now, keeping in mind that this film is being made for an American audience that doesn't really know a whole lot about New Zealand politics, could you briefly explain what the Green Party is and what its policies are? Sure. Well, you've got to start from our principles, uh, because all our policies come out of a foundation of principles, which are four. They are um, ecological wisdom, appropriate decision making, that which generally means participatory democracy, non-violence, and social justice. So those are the four pillars, if you like, that hold everything together. There's a preamble to our principles, which is also about recognising Te Tiriti o Waitangi, which is the treaty signed between the British Crown and the Māori tribes, uh, which established the government in New Zealand. Um, how, how does this, uh, sorry, how does this differ from other parties in Parliament? Um, well, I would say that most parties are not driven by principle, they're driven by expediency and um, what's the populist issue of the time. I'd make a few uh, exemptions from that. The Māori Party is clearly driven from a strong philosophical view. They're based on kaupapa Māori, and it's not that they just want to benefit Māori, they, they want to benefit all New Zealanders, but they're driven from a kaupapa Māori and a recognition that, um, that they have to build uh, the capacity of Māori and the self-determination of Māori people for that to work. The other, the other uh, group is really the ACT Party, which is a kind of neoliberal, um, kind of far-right party, which are driven, I think, by principle as well. Um, and it's, the interesting thing is that the Greens and the ACT actually have quite a lot in common on kind of libertarian civil rights issues, but we're far apart on the economic issues. We tend to have a lot in common with the Māori Party because looking after the earth is a fundamental part of Māori tikanga. Um, yeah, so, but I, I mean, from my view, the other parties are mostly driven by expediency. Uh, how much influence would you say the third parties have in MNP? Potentially quite a lot. Under MNP, we don't have a single party being the majority in Parliament. It's very unlikely that will happen again. And so as a result, to form a government, they have to make a coalition. And to pass legislation, they need to have a coalition of, of parties as well. And they may not be the same. Like, you can have a party supporting, say, Labour to be the government, but they might not support all the legislation. So they'll need to do deals with other parties to get legislation through. And what it means is that um, small parties or MNP parties have potentially quite a lot of influence depending on the issue of the time. That's always tempered by the recognition that if you're a party that's only 10%, you've only got 10% support, you can't take that too far. You, you know, uh, the, the electorate will be extremely upset if, you, if they felt you were kind of pushing your weight around too much. So the, the influence you have is tempered by an acknowledgement of your size and, and, and proportionality, but also, as I say, the specific legislation or policy or decision being made at the time uh, if, you're, if the government needs your vote to get something through, obviously that gives you quite a lot of leverage. Okay. And um, do you believe in having a party uh, to, a left, uh, to the left labour on social issues and some economic issues? Uh, it, it would be fair to say that the Greens are to the left of labour, right? Um, th there's a big debate within the Green Party whether we're a left-wing party or not. And uh, because we've, we've been pigeonholed into kind of being left of labour. I personally reject that label, I don't think it's really accurate. There are some issues in which we are left wing and left of labour, and particularly perhaps on economic issues. There are issues around um, the constraints on the state, which some might say is more aligned to traditional right wing thinking. Uh, to my mind, to, to view the political uh, polarity, or to view it as a, as a polarity between left and right is, is fundamentally misconceived. To my mind, there's, a, there's, a, there's at least a three-way split between um, statism, s corporatism, and community focus. Now, I think the Greens are community focused, which means that at times we share something in common with the other two, and sometimes we're out on our own. So, do you think that that's pressured Labour, uh, having parties like the Green Party, like ACT, like all these third parties, has that prompted Labour and National to change their uh, stances? for more uh, broad parties to more narrower centrist parties or vice versa or where do you feel about that? It's an interesting question. Um, 
there, there's a big ruck in the centre ground, there's no doubt of that. And of course at the same time the centre ground has shifted to the right if you like because of the, um, the way that kind of neoliberal economics has, has been so um, hegemonic around the world including in this country. Um, so there's a big ruck in the centre ground and that leaves the space for small parties to kind of find a niche in the electorate if you like, like the Greens and like Hacks and whatever. Um, whether that means that Labour, for example, now no longer has an environmental wing because the environmentalists will go green and so Labour says, well, we don't need to worry about that. I don't think that that's been the case. I think, I think what's happened, if I look at green issues and, and particularly environmental issues, I think what's happened is that because of the unconstrained ability to talk that the Green Party has that a Labour environmentalist doesn't have, it's meant that those issues have become more visible and have been taken up by the mainstream more and so Labour has responded by actually becoming more environmentally focused than they were before. But that's not true of all issues, I think it depends to a degree on how much resonance the particular issue has got in the public mind. Just going to switch knees here. Um, so, uh, could you tell me a little bit about uh, the McGillicuddy series? I'm not leading up to a joke. I, uh, I'm really kind of interested. Uh, yeah. The McGillicuddy series party stopped being, well, it was never really a major contender, but it stopped being a contender right around the time the MMP came That's right, through. Yeah. Are those two things related? I think they are. I mean, I, I know a lot of people in the McGillicuddy's and took part in some of their satire and stuff. I mean, the McGillicuddy's were a very funny, very successful political satire organisation and performance troupe. They did political satire elections very successfully, both local body and national elections. Very, very funny, um, very clever, sophisticated humour. They also did a lot of um, just general performance, they did um, pageants, they did all kinds of stuff. I think it's true that with, when MMP came in, a lot of McGillicuddy's felt that their role was no longer necessary, that they had been satirising the two big power blocks of Labour and National, and that under MMP actually it was more important to see small parties get into Parliament. And so I think that they kind of withdrew from electoral campaigning to make space for that. And there's, there's other internal organisational things been going on as well, and you'd have to talk to them about that. Um, but I do think that, that the two things are connected, although I think it's a shame because I think there's still a need for the kind of very clever political satire that they um, gifted to the people of New Zealand. Um, so when people vote in mixed member proportional elections, do you think they're voting more for the people in the party or are they voting more for the policies of the party? In other words, is it the personality or the idea? Um, I think it's still probably largely personality driven. For most parties, because most parties are so authoritarian and hierarchical, they're voting for the leader. So New Zealand First really gets its vote from Winston Peters, the leader. And most people couldn't even tell you who their other MPs actually are. Um, and the, the leader and the policies are a bit indistinguishable because they're part of a package. For the Greens, I think, um, we don't have the same hierarchical decision-making mode and we don't have the same models of leadership, so we tend to, all of our MPs are much more active. Uh, people probably know the Green Party MPs a lot more than they do other parties. And, but even, and I think people do vote for personality because they want someone to be there that they trust to make good decisions, but it's also driven by the principle and policy that drives it. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's actually quite hard to disentangle, I think. Um, I mean, ultimately, I think what we may see developing under MMP, because, because it's mixed member, so you've got half the parliament is elected to represent an area and half is elected on the party list. I think what we may eventually see, and what I'd like to see, is electorate MPs elected specifically as geographical representatives. They're there to represent their electorate, and party affiliations become less important and people vote on the party list for the philosophy that they want to see govern the country and I think that that would be quite a good way of really disentangling what the roles of those different kinds of MPs are and making sense more of the political system 
but I don't think that's really how it works yet. I just noticed the tattoo on your right arm that says uh, terrorist. Oh yes, it's, it was. Um, we've been holding uh, demonstrations against the terrorism suppression legislation, and um, we had someone in a George Bush mask branding uh, members of the audience, one of which was me. So. Um, okay, so that's not permanent. No, no, no. It's just a stamp. Okay, good. Not that it's good, but I mean, like, well, I don't have an opinion either way because it could have been something very clever. And never did. Never. It's still star -struck. Um Do you? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the, uh, the whole thing with the exclusive brethren and the uh, and how that kind of led to the uh, current controversial like tomorrow's finance bill? Yeah. Well. Basically, we, we have spending caps in New Zealand on how much political parties can spend on electioneering. And at the last election, what we saw was the exclusive brethren, who are, um, I mean, if it's, it's a closed religious community uh, who don't vote, don't participate in politics. What we saw was them funding a very large campaign, uh, over a million dollars, basically aimed at, at uh, getting they Labour get out why? and electing nationalists in the government. Now, non-political parties have a right to engage in election activity. Mm -hmm. The problem was that they did it secretly. They, they while they have to, adver advertisements for example, have to be declared who authorised them, they did it in a way that it was difficult to identify who was actually behind it. And also, it's fairly obvious that they colluded very strongly with the National Party to make sure that the branding was resonant and that it had the intended effect. So, people, I think a lot of people got very concerned that uh, about this kind of secretive funding of election campaigns. And really, it seemed like a way that the National Party could avoid their spending limits by simply getting another organisation to do campaigning for them. So the government's introduced the electoral finance legislation which, is, which says that if you're a non-political party doing election campaigning, you have to declare who you are, you have to register uh, once you spend over $12,000 I think it is. And, um, and there, there's spending limits, you can only spend 120000 which is still a lot of money in the, in the context of, the, of a New Zealand election campaign, um, but it's much less than the exclusive president spent at the last election. Uh, unfortunately, I think the Labor government has really messed up the, both the bill and the process around the bill, and so it's um, it's become a, a political debate that's kind of in some ways lost sight of what the actual objectives are, which is to in, is which is to in, increase transparency in the New Zealand electoral system. Um, do you think there's been an increase or a decrease in negative campaigning since MMP was established, or has it stayed the same? Um, I, I certainly don't think you could say there's been an increase under, I mean the, the campaigns that National was running when Rob Muldoon was Prime Minister were, were hideous. Um, I guess some of the stuff Don Brash did wasn't that much better so I, I think I'd probably say it stayed about the same. I think there's probably less appetite for negative campaigning in New Zealand than there might be in the United States for example. Some of the stuff I've seen from the States has been pretty vicious. Um, and I don't think the electorate, it's, it's always a dangerous thing in New Zealand because the electorate can get turned off that kind of campaigning quite strongly. Um, but it probably hasn't changed a great deal. And, uh... although, although if I could add to that, I mean one of the interesting things is that what National will now do is attack the Green Party because we're a potential coalition partner for Labour. And so they will see, they will, they will um, attack us uh, quite untruthfully, but as a way of kind of discrediting the Labour package, if you like. Well, do you think that they're playing tactics by targeting the Greens, which are much closer to the 5% uh, threshold? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, Nick Smith, in a paper he wrote for the National Party Regional Conference, was quite explicit in saying if we could knock a percent off the Green Party, at the last election, you know, we wouldn't have been in, and Labour couldn't have formed a government, or, or it was it would have changed the numbers considerably because of the lost votes if we hadn't been in. So um, I think it is quite a clear, explicit tactical game of theirs. Um, whether it succeeds is another thing. Um, so uh, in the United States, the Green Party can't even get on the ballot in some states. And yeah. Why is the Green Party comparatively effective here in New Zealand? Is it because of MMP or because New Zealand has more of a green tradition? Or 
Oh, I think that um, I'm not. I think it's pretty clear that having proportional representation makes all the difference. I'm not aware of a Green Party elected to a national legislature anywhere in the world except under a proportional representation system of some kind. We have seen Greens elected to local body. I know in the States you've got a few, you've got a mayor and, and some local body people. But to get represented to a national legislature is, is really difficult. And in fact, I think Jeanette Fitzsimons, our co-leader, is the only Green elected to win a seat uh, in a first past the post election, which is what, what the electorate side of MMP, how that works, and she did win the seat. So yes, MMP makes all the difference. The, the, the problem is, and I, and I don't think New Zealanders, New Zealanders are a lot more green than anywhere in the world. I think there's a substantial minority of people all around the world who are deeply concerned about the environment and social justice and non-violence and those things. And including in the States, I mean, you've got a very strong activist community there, and, and I've seen quite big representations of that. But people aren't represented in the in the legislature in that who, who have those views. Um, so I don't. So I don't think that. Um, I don't think it's a proportion of the population thing. I think it's simply that you've got an undemocratic, unrepresentative electoral system. Um. How have uh, the Greens been particularly effective in pushing forward some of its most important policies? Um, when, when pursuing policies, there's, there's, there's kind of two elements to it. One is um, the, the importance of engaging with the public and uh, raising people's awareness and understanding and providing information about issues. And so a lot of what we do is around that. Climate change is a good example where um, not just the Greens, but things like Al Gore's movie, the Stern report from Britain, the IPCC reports have all been part of a wave, which we've been part of, of raising issues around climate change and the importance of it, the significance of what we're facing, and so changing the kind of public mood, which has then influenced the government to start to take those issues seriously. The other side is actual involvement in policy development and legislation, um, and again, under climate change, because of the expertise that the Greens have around this area, we've been a, a, um, we've been able to participate in policy making, setting the framework for New Zealand's emission trading scheme, which I think has improved it quite a lot. Um, so you've got that opportunity to, en to engage in policy setting, uh, which. And that depends a bit on who the minister is and what the relationships are and what the issues are. There's also, when legislation is passing, the ability to make amendments to it. And if the government relies on our votes, then, as I said, there's quite a lot of leverage and we can have quite a lot of influence just through amendments to legislation as it's passing through. So there's a number of ways that you use the tools of, of, uh, that are available to you as a member of parliament. And it, it depends very much on the issue and the timing and momentum, whatever. I don't mean to put you on the spot, yeah. and this is going to be a difficult question, and, but I was, I was wondering, you know, uh, since social justice is one of the main planks of the, uh, of the Green Party, it's very obvious that you feel that social justice was not served in the Two Ho case. Uh, do, would you consider putting an ultimatum forward, uh, saying that you would uh, consider partnering with someone other than Labour in the, uh, and I'm speaking of national, in the next election, if some of these changes aren't rectified? Well, I mean, it's an interesting question, but it, it, it's, it's difficult tactically because the terrorism suppression legislation was passed with just about everyone in Parliament voting for it except the Greens. Um, I think the, oh, the Māori Party wasn't there at the time. I think ACT might have voted against it. The Māori Party certainly voted against the amendments, uh, the latest amendments. So the point is, if we supported National to be the government, uh, they would have done the same thing in any case, possibly even been worse. And in any case, even if we voted for National, it wouldn't change the government. We're currently not voting for the government to be the government. We're abstaining on conference and supply votes. And what that means is those kinds of ultimatums are just about impossible under most circumstances. Uh, the question for us is always what is the leverage we've got at this particular moment in this particular issue and and there's also the question of is, is using that leverage going to result in a better or worse outcome? Supporting nationally with the government would probably result in a worse outcome. 
So therefore the question is, well, what can we actually do practically speaking? And as I say, there's always tools available, but sometimes you just have to be a bit more subtle about what you, what, what you can do. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about the Electoral Reform Commission and uh, Rod Donald? Uh, Rod, well, I know that Rod was extremely important in the campaign to get MMP into New Zealand. Uh, he was quite a key campaigner, uh, along with others as well. I mean, it wasn't, a, it wasn't him on his own. There was a, there was a huge movement, a grassroots movement, uh, and a lot of people involved. But he was certainly a key player in it. Um, I wasn't really active in the uh, electoral reform coalition myself. I was overseas uh, around when the campaign was kicking off and just came back to the country. So, um, so I can't. I mean, you'd have to talk to someone else for details of, of how that campaign works. Really. Well, we're interviewing Helena Pat later on. Uh, okay. So cool. Can I get a new tape, please? Yeah, yep. Sorry, we're just going to change the tape. Yep. Left. You know, someone gets on the couch and then the next day someone else gets. I'll sleep during the day. Yeah. We're, we're rolling. All right. Um, do you think MMP has made uh, politicians more accountable? I think it has. I think what we had on the first past the post was a lot of backbenchers in both the Labour and the National Party were on a cruise. Because if you're in a big party and you're not on the front bench, you're not a minister or shadow minister, there's nothing to do. They won't let you do anything. You're not allowed to talk about anything in case you embarrass them. You're not allowed to campaign on anything unless you embarrass them. So basically, it's, you, know, you, 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 you sit down, you shut up and you're voting for it. You vote when you're told. So. Inevitably, that's a bit dispiriting. So you end up with people just kind of picking up the salary and the perks and don't really do much else. Under MMP, that's no longer possible. Um, it's cut out a lot of that kind of backbencher voting fodder. If you're in a small party, you have to work hard because you, you don't, you, you won't get selected by your party if you're not really active and out there and doing stuff. And so there's less, there's less kind of of that fodder. And then in the, and even in the big parties, because it's putting the pressure on them. And there's a, there's a kind of a benchmark that people can go, oh, that's what a hardworking MP looks like. What are you guys doing? It kind of puts the pressure on the big parties as well. So they're a lot more um, ruthless about kind of cleaning out the, the, the dead branches, if you like. So I, think it, so I think it's improved the performance of parliamentarians generally. Um, I think that, um, that uh, it, it also, it kind of, it just means there's more voices in there, there's more representation in there and so people can't get away with the same kind of platitudes because they're actually being challenged when, when they talk crap. Um, so that, I think that's all good. I think there is an issue around uh, a sitting MP who loses their seat but is re-elected on the party list and people get very concerned about that. Um, especially like it happened with some of the ministers last election. But I think, I think it's a, it is an inevitable outcome of MMP and I don't think that it is a bad thing because to win an electorate seat, you've got to be a good local MP. It means you've got to go to the flower shows, you've got to remember, remember everyone's name when you see them in the street, you've got to be at the school openings and you've got to do all that kind of make sure everyone feels loved and welcomed. To be a good Minister of Finance takes entirely different skills. Just because you're a good election MP doesn't mean you make a good Minister of Finance and vice versa. So why should the Minister of Finance be chosen on the basis of whether they're good at kissing babies? So I think it makes sense that, um, that there is some opportunity for people to be elected to Parliament who are there to represent a point of view and, they, and, they, and who may be highly skilled and, and are still being voted on, they're still being elected, but just through a different kind of operation. Um, how has MMP affected the lives of New Zealanders who don't follow politics in current events? Um, well, it's hard to say. I mean, I think it's made our, um, I think it has made Parliament more representative, and even people who don't follow Parliament particularly, I think, still kind of recognise that. You know, they, they can see there's more diversity in Parliament. They can see people who maybe they relate to a bit more, they feel a bit more is like them. The other thing I think that's important in the context of New Zealand is that it's added a safety constraint to the parliamentary system. We have a unicameral system, we have no upper house. We have no written and judiciable constitution. We've got a, uh, 
a, a, a number of constitutional arrangements, some of which are legislative, some of which are things like the letters patent and the like, and they're not enforceable in the courts. So what it means is there's no real constraint on the New Zealand legislature. There's also a very strong convention that Parliament is sovereign and there are no kind of legal constraints on Parliament's ability to act. You know, I think that's enormously dangerous and we have seen at times very rapid change being made to laws and very little um, constraint on, on the ability of Parliament to pass them under urgency if they want to and, and with no public scrutiny if they want to. MNP has changed that because now you no longer have a government with a simple majority or a party with a simple majority. It means to pass legislation they have to negotiate with other parties. Almost certainly other parties won't put up with them passing stuff through under urgency with no public consultation. For most small parties public consultation is going to be a basic requirement. And so it's meant there's just that much more constraint in the process. There's blockages that just mean they can't just whip stuff through quickly in the dead of night. Um, and I think that that, even though people might not even recognise that, I think that's been of enormous benefit to all New Zealanders. And hypothetically, would you do anything to change MNP? Um, I, I, from my point of view, the two things I'd do to change our electoral system is I'd probably lower the the, the percentage threshold from 5% to maybe 4% and that might allow in parties that I don't like, don't agree with, but that's democracy. It's better for people to be represented, regardless of what I think about them, than to not be represented, I think. Um, so I'd, change, I'd lower the threshold and the other thing, I'd extend the parliamentary term. We have a three year electoral term, electoral cycle and it's just too short. You know, the government spends one year recovering from the election, one year preparing for the election and one year in the middle actually doing stuff. So I think a four year term would effectively increase the, the real working ability of Parliament. That's all I have. Uh, Helen, did you have any questions? No, that's cool. Well, thank you for sharing your uh, time. And, cool, uh, my pleasure. Uh, there is the paper Let's quickly that you... move back here, actually. Oh, oh. oh yeah, I was going to oh, oh. They all seem like yeah. sensible questions. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I worked on them. They were for Russell, but uh, I figured, you know, you know, take the opportunities as they come out. Sure. Oh, there is, well, actually, maybe I, well. What's that, man? Well, I was going to uh, ask him, you know, about the diversity in Parliament, and I forgot to, because uh, you're a Rastafarian, correct? Yeah. Uh, and, um, but that really doesn't, do you think that has any relevance to MMP, or? Well, Just in the relevance. sense of the greater diversity, as I, I mean, I did mention that, you know, Parliament's more representative and there's greater diversity, and that's one of the symptoms of that. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Um, if you have my, uh, you have my card, yeah. if you need any email, and if you need to crash in Austin, you're always welcome. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. Thanks. Nice meeting, man. Same. And um, let me know um, what happens to it, because I'll be interested to watch it. Yeah, we're going to send out a mass email about cool. distribution when it happens. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, man. See ya. That was sweet, man. That was. And that was a good interview. The, and look at the background, goddammit. Yeah. Damn it. yeah.